Hello and welcome to this lecture on organizational structure. Organizations are comprised of people and most organizations have hierarchical relationships between people. Some are at the top and some are at the bottom. On the bright side, people get to decide on the structure in which they immerse themselves. On the dark side, far too many organizations are poorly configured because they forget the golden rule. That rule is that structure always follows strategy. Companies decide what they want to do, and then they should decide how they are organized to do it, not vice versa. Let's get started. An organization is not really an organization unless things are organized. That is, unless they are coordinated. Coordination efforts are mechanisms that companies use to make sure that everybody is on the same page, so to speak. When we think about organizational structure in general, we're really talking about the relationships between people and the relationships between positions that people hold in the organization. The first coordinating mechanism is informal communication, which is simply the sharing of information using a high media richness technique, which is usually face to face. Media richness theory suggests that messages that are rich that is, that contain a lot of information, need to be expressed with some immediacy. And those that benefit from a two-way exchange of information are best expressed in a medium that facilitates that. For example, the issuance of an annual 10K report by a large company is less rich than a visit from the CEO in one's office. The former is only a one-way communication and occurs only once a year. The latter involves true verbal dialogue and can occur many times a day. Informal communication is almost always rich communication because the urgency or importance of the information is not coordinated through formal communication channels. The most important information on which we have to rely very, very, very quickly is often informally communicated. Another mechanism for coordination in an organization is, of course, the formal hierarchy that entails linkages and direct supervision. This is very common in a very large firm. The problem is that the more bureaucratic the hierarchy is, the more problems it's likely to encounter in its coordination. Some of these problems include the fact that it's often quite costly to maintain a formal hierarchy, it's slow to act and react, and it's actually quite unpopular with the modern workplace. No one wants to have their boss have to check with their boss who checks with their boss who checks with their boss simply to get a new red stapler. So if the formal hierarchy is comprised of many, many layers of bureaucracy, then it can stifle communication and the ability to act quickly. Another coordinating mechanism that organizations use is standardization. There are three types of this standardization. First is a standardized process. This could include, for example, formal instructions on how to bolt a thingamajig to a whatchamacallit on an assembly line. This is a formalized set of instructions that allows us to all engage in the best process used to solve a particular problem. The process has become standardized over time. Someone has figured out that the best way to do it Standardized outputs are another coordinating mechanism. Organizations should have very clear goals and very clear output measures. For example, if we're going to measure performance of outside salespersons, we could use a sales quota that states that each salesperson must sell 10,000 widgets a month. This is how we measure their productivity and their performance, and this would be a standardized output measure across the board. We also tend to standardize skills. For example, if an entry-level job requires a certain proficiency in written English, and we have some outstanding new employees for whom English is a second language, then we can offer training on how to write in English so that their skills will be on a par with everyone else. Another example is that we might have certain credentials that indicate a minimum acceptable standard of skills for certain positions. We may require that all people who are engaged in financial planning have the Chartered Financial Analyst credential, or all accountants in the firm have the CPA credential. 
Because these requirements apply uniformly to everyone in the organization, they are a standardized set of skills. Let's move on. There are some key elements of organizational structure that will help us define and differentiate one type of structure from another. One key element is the so-called span of control. It's sort of an odd phrase, but it's actually just the number of people who directly report to the next level in the hierarchy. Sometimes these people on one level who report to a person on the next higher level are referred to as subordinates or as direct reports. A direct report or subordinate is someone for whom you conduct periodic performance appraisals and who reports to you and only you. The span of control assumes that there's a certain amount of coordination through immediate direct supervision. The wider the span of control is, the greater the number of people who are supervised. This helps us differentiate a tall organizational structure from a flat structure. A very flat organization may have only three layers. Those layers include entry level, mid-management, and CEO. In a company with 100 employees, there might be only three mid-level managers and of course one CEO in that very flat organization. Therefore, each mid-level manager is going to be coordinating 32 different subordinates. The CEO coordinates three subordinates. The mid-level managers who coordinate the efforts and work of 32 different subordinates have a large or a wide span of control. The CEO does not. Remember that these people report to only one person, and that person is responsible for each of the 32 employees' performance. On the other hand, as the organization becomes tall, then the span of control becomes small. For that same firm with 100 employees, if there are nine layers in the structure that include everyone from entry level employee to CEO, then each manager supervises only a handful of employees. As the organization is flattened, span of control becomes wide and numerous. And as it becomes tall, the span of control becomes narrow and few. This is also related to the degree of centralization, which is the degree to which formal decision-making authority is held by a few people who are usually at the top of the organization. A highly centralized organization will have a very tall structure, and people at the top tend to make those decisions. For example, the U.S. Army has a very centralized decision-making process by necessity whereas a decentralized structure tends to be very flat and people on the front lines, so to speak, tend to make the decisions on behalf of the organization. For example, a group of door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salespersons may have a decentralized structure to facilitate price negotiations and such things with customers. The next element is something known as formalization. And this is the degree to which organizations standardize behaviors through formal rules, procedures, and training, and formal related mechanisms. It overlaps mightily with standardization, but represents a strict adherence to standardized processes, outputs, or skills. Formalization increases as firms get older, larger, and more regulated. New firms, entre entrepreneurial firms, and startup ventures tend not to have formalized procedures yet. They're just not sure what's the one best way to do this, that, or the other. As an organization evolves and gets larger and has more layers, then certain problems which have come up in the past tend to be formalized. The next element is an element that helps us define and differentiate organizational structure, and it's called departmentalization. This is the essence of the structure that we're going to be talking about throughout most of the rest of this lecture here. The departmentalization establishes the chain of command, which is the supervision structure that is imposed upon a group of people. This can help create a common mental model, the way we do things here, as opposed to not being sure about how to do those things. This helps us develop certain measures of performance, and it also encourages the staff to coordinate through formal and informal communication. If we know to whom we report and to whom that person reports, then we have a concept of how the structure is departmentalized. Let's move on.
Burns and Stalker have used the previous things to categorize organizational structures into two very broad categories. On the left, we have a sort of structure that has a very narrow span of control with high formalization and high centralization. This is going to be a prototypically tall organization, and it's going to be called a mechanistic organization because it is usually older, it has a narrow span of control, highly formalized procedures, and most of the decisions are mechanized or centralized. A mechanistic structure is not going to be very quick to respond to consumer demands. The other type of organizational structure has the opposite elements. This is going to be a prototypically flat structure. It is a very wide span of control, very little formalization, and very decentralized decision making. Burns and Stalker refer to this as an organic structure. Most organizational firm forms are of one type or the other. But we find that as organizations evolve from an original entrepreneurial startup venture mode, which is usually an organic structure, they tend to start developing more towards a mechanistic structure. And then they have to fight to be able to respond to consumer demands. Think about an industry that has a very high product development rate, like consumer electronics. And then think about a contracting industry like iron ore strip mining. Strip mining has probably not changed much in 100 years, except for maybe the size of the equipment that they use. But consumer electronic products tend to have a very short shelf life, and that industry is in a constant state of change. Consumers are fickle, and they want the latest, greatest device that may be popular now, but may not be popular at all in six months or a year. Anyone remember MySpace, the Palm Pilot, and telephone answering machines? To be able to respond and empower employees to make decisions based on consumer demands, an organic structure may work better in an industry like that, despite, nevertheless, in spite of the age of the company. The mechanistic structure may work better in more stable and unchanging industries like strip mining. Let's move on. What we see here is the CEO at the top of the organizational structure, and we see four overlapping ellipses. In this and the following diagrams, we will use ovals or boxes to denote a person or a position. These ovals in this structure have people's names in them because this structure doesn't yet really have positions with formal names like VP of XYZ or something. This is the typical structure for a brand new entrepreneurial venture. Here we have a very minimal hierarchy. The staff, Joe, Mary, Frank, and Susan, all directly report to the owner. These ovals overlap and they do not have lines around them, which suggests that their roles are fairly loosely defined so that this firm can maintain flexibility. This structure makes use of very informal communication to coordinate what it is that each of the employees do. On any given day, Joe may be involved in packaging, accounting, operations, or human resources. Mary may be involved in all of those things on any given day as well. These people's roles overlap with each other because they are not strictly defined roles. However, it can still be a highly centralized structure if the owner makes most decisions. So don't confuse simple structure with decentralized structure. It can be decentralized and it can be centralized. That is not a requirement of this structure. This is, again, the simple structure. It is very common in the very early stages of a firm's existence. For example, Jobs and Waz developed the Apple computer when they had no employees. Hewlett and Packard started their company in their own garage. Many entrepreneurial venture firms will start out by hiring their friends, and their friends do a variety of different jobs. These jobs change from day to day. However, a simple structure will usually evolve in its complexity as the firm becomes more successful and has to hire more people. Let's move on. The second form of organizational structure is the functional structure. It has the CEO or president at the top, and on the second level, it has three vice presidents. 
as we will see, the second level of an organizational structure typically defines the type of structure used. In the functional structure, the second level is occupied by specific business functions, marketing, production, and finance in this example. Each of them may or may not have subordinates underneath them. It might be a four-person firm, but that's pretty unlikely. If there is a need for someone called the vice president, then they are probably not an entry-level employee, and there could be hundreds or even thousands of employees whose reporting relationships branch off into three or four or ten or more levels beneath that of the vice presidents. However, a company with a functional form sees it necessary and efficient to organize itself around specific business functions. The advantages of this form is that it supports a professional identity and helps define clear career paths. For example, the subordinates of the vice president of finance work in finance. They do not work in production. The vice president of production has their own subordinates who are in production. The VP of marketing has their own subordinates who are in marketing. One disadvantage is that you tend to develop what are called silos of knowledge because there is virtually no horizontal transfer of personnel, nor sometimes even ideas. Finance people speak their own language. Marketing people speak their own language, and production people have their own language. In fact, it would be very rare for the vice president of finance and the vice president of production to swap jobs. Similarly, the subordinates of the vice president of finance, who are financial analysts and planners, would probably do a very poor job as marketing analysts and marketing experts. On the other hand, the silos of knowledge help us develop clear career paths within the silo, a strong sense of personal identity, and greater degrees of specialization. Supervision of these subordinates is easier because of the common pool of talent within each of these silos. Another disadvantage is that a subunit's goals may be more important to the subunit than they are to the organization's goals. For example, the finance people likely want to maximize the stuff that's good for the finance department, and the marketing people want to maximize their stuff, and they all lose sight of the superordinate goal, that is, the success of the company. Another disadvantage is the limitation of poorer communication. That is, they just don't speak the same language in their insulated silos. Each area has its own functional expertise, and it tends to limit the horizontal transfer of people because they've grown up in their own silos. The most obvious example of functional structure is a university's college of business. It likely has a department of finance, a department of accounting, a department of marketing, a department of management, and maybe some other departments. These departments are their own silos of expertise. A marketing professor will never be a finance professor. An accounting professor will never be a management professor. In fact, sometimes professors of finance and professors of marketing don't even understand each other. They have such a narrow area of true legitimate expertise that they're experts in their own silo of knowledge, but not in another silo. To combat this, some colleges of business have actually grouped functions or departments together, or they've had members of different departments co-teach a particular class because they want students to get the integrated picture of the entire business. Thus, there are ways of getting out of your silo, but it's very, very difficult. Let's move on. The third form that an organization can take is a divisional structure which can be set up along product lines, geographic lines, customer lines, etc. There are a variety of different subtypes of divisional structure. And like with other structures, the defining characteristic of the structure is what is at the second level. The second level could have persons in charge of North America, South America, and Europe. Or the second level could have persons in charge of government sales, business to business sales, and retail sales to individuals. On this slide, we have different product divisions because this company feels that its products are so different from each other that the company simply must organize itself around products. So we have a vice president of home repair products, which is very different from lighting products and certainly different from medical equipment. And each of them has their own vice president. 
One advantage of this is that it helps with the building blocks of the structure. That is, it can accommodate growth. The company may tend to want to focus on medical systems if those are more profitable, or consumer products if those happen to become more profitable, and ultimately it can divert resources between them. One disadvantage is the duplication of resources. For example, usually underneath the vice president of consumer product silo, there is a director of finance, director of marketing, director of human resources. Under the vice president of lighting products, there's also a director of finance, director of marketing, director of human resources. The same thing for the VP of medical systems. That is a clear redundancy underneath each of these product lines. We have three directors of finance, three directors of marketing, three directors of human resources. Because of this duplication, it is sometimes an inefficient way of organizing the firm. However, most firms are actually hybridized structures. Most firms may be a functional structure or divisional geographic or divisional product, but underneath that they may have regions or they may have functions. As firms grow larger, they tend to become truly hybridized. Again, though, it's the second level that defines the structure. As firms grow larger and larger, the structure becomes clearer and clearer. If you see an organizational structure chart that says Vice President of Finance, Vice President of Marketing, Vice President of Accounting on the second level, then it's a functional structure. If you see an organizational chart that says VP North America, VP Latin America, VP Europe at the second level, then it's a divisional structure and technically a divisional geographic structure. Let's move on. This is a matrix structure. In this matrix, we have borrowed employees from engineering, marketing, and design. Each yellow dot represents a particular person. Each functional manager lends 11 persons to these three projects. This particular structure is best used for short-term projects and task forces. One disadvantage is that it is incredibly expensive to run a matrix structure because each yellow dot represents one person who now has two managers. For example, the four persons from engineering who have been lent to Project A temporarily have two managers. When visually arranged by solely by their reporting relationships, it can develop into an inverted management structure. In a typical structure, each manager has several subordinates, not vice versa. The matrix structure could be like a V rather than a pyramid. In a V-shaped hierarchy, as you go up the hierarchy, you have more managers for each subordinate. That's going to be very, very expensive. Other disadvantages include goal conflict, ambiguity, and a dilution of accountability because every subordinate now has two bosses. An engineer on Project A might have a problem and wonder if they should go to the engineering manager or the Project A manager. If the engineer goes to both, then that will take up time with both managers regarding the problem. Such quandaries can be very, very stressful, time-consuming, and expensive. There are some advantages. First is that you can use resources and expertise effectively. Second is that you can improve communication between the different functions on each of the projects, thus enhancing flexibility and fostering innovation. Third is that you can focus particular specialists on clients and products. An example of effective short-term use of a matrix structure involves American automobile makers during the 2008 financial crisis when they decided that they had to produce more fuel-efficient cars because the Koreans and the Japanese and many of the European companies were producing smaller, lighter, more fuel-efficient cars, and times were getting tough economically. When fuel prices escalated beyond comprehension during the crisis, they had to very, very quickly design new fuel-efficient cars. A typical American automobile manufacturer might need to design three fuel-efficient cars. We'll call them Project A, Project B, and C. And we need people from engineering, marketing, and design to work on them. After each project is finished, they all go back to their regular jobs. In this manner, 
the best use of matrix structures was used to form a short-term task force or a special project case. Let's move on. The fifth form of organizational structure is a team-based structure. It is not used very often at all, but when it is used, it is used to run best with self-directed work teams. Such teams have near total autonomy on what they do, how they do it, the resources they use, and even who's a member of the team. If we organize our team-based structure around work processes, this can work very well. For example, let's think of a typical assembly line process where people stand at their stations and the conveyor belt brings the product in various stages of completion to the self-directed work teams. Each team is responsible for putting together the complete car. The team may have six or eight people on it and they walk at one to two miles per hour at the speed of the conveyor belt as they accompany the car from its beginning to its end when it rolls off the assembly line. They make that product from start to finish. They get to decide who does what and on what day. They get to decide how to use the tools, the time, and other resources. They even get to decide who's on the team. This requires a high degree of skill and proficiency. And we typically only allow a team-based structure when we have employees whom we trust a lot. With a team-based structure, the result is a very flat hierarchy because these teams do not need managers. There's also going to be very little formalization because these teams don't have a one best way to do everything. They sometimes work by trial and error until they find out the best way for the team to organize its functions around the product or the service that it is that they're working on. The team-based structure is the most autonomous structure for an organization. Let's move on. The sixth form of organizational structure is a network structure. It's highly organic and completely flexible. The efficiencies that it holds are attained from acquiring and discarding resources as they're needed for more partnerships. So think about a core firm that comes up with a really good idea. What they do is they then take their idea and find a marketing partner. And that partner could be in Canada or anywhere else in the world. They find a call center partner to handle customer relations in India, a British design package partner, and a Mexican assembly partner. The beautiful thing about this is the core firm maintains their own core competencies of the original idea and the product itself. They focus on those competencies and outsource the, thing, the things that they're not so good at or that don't leverage their core competencies. These outsourced partners can be replaced. If a call center partner in India doesn't work out, then they can find a call center partner in Oklahoma or in any other part of the world. If their accounting company is no longer viable, then they can fire them and find someone in California or Spain. On the downside, there may be a shortage of facilities and talent in these other firms and locations. Call centers in India may be booked solid. Designers in the UK may have all the projects they can handle. Maybe political uncertainty and violence affect assembly line manufacturing companies in Mexico, and they have to get it assembled in China, which can have its own problems and issues. Additionally, they have very little control over the non-core work processes. They can replace the partner at a moment's notice, but they can't really have day-to-day -day control over them if they're not co-located with them. This requires a lot of virtual work, and the partners are often easily replaceable, but that has its own issues. Many of the projects on kickstarter.com will use this particular form. They come up with a great idea or a prototype or a proof of concept, and then they outsource the rest of the operation to partners in other areas of the country or the world. Let's move on. There is no one best organizational structure for any company. Each company is organized to maximize its performance. However, the relationship between organizational structure and firm performance depends upon a lot of things. 
The some organizational structures lead to better performance than other structures, depending upon or contingent upon the business environment in which they operate. Let's look at some environmental contingencies that are of concern to organizations as they try and maximize the relationship between organizational structure and organizational performance. The first of four contingencies concerns the rate of change in the environment. That the categories in the environment are therefore either dynamic, noted as D, or stable, noted as S. An environment that is dynamic has a high rate of change. A stable environment has steady conditions and predictable change. If the environment is dynamic, then the best structure would be an organic structure, to borrow from Burns and Stalker, because the organic structure has the imperative that the firm is able to nearly immediately respond to changes in the environment, which could include new customer bases, new government regulations, the rise and fall of business alliances, etc. In a stable environment, some forms of the mechanistic structure work well because the rate of change in the environment is slow. So, because mechanistic structures are slow to move and react, then it is a moot point in a stable environment. A second contingency concerns the number of stakeholders in the operating environment, and that contingency or number is either complex, noted as C, or simple, noted as S. A complex environment requires the ability to respond to many more stakeholders than a simple environment, so it should be decentralized and have a flatter structure in order to make a host of lower level decisions to respond properly to the many, many stakeholders that are encountered. That is, an organic structure works best in complex environments. A simple environment has very few stakeholders and major decisions are fewer than in a complex environment, so a centralized structure works best. Thus, the BEX structure for that is likely to be a mechanical one. A third contingency concerns the number of products, clients, or regions in which it operates. This environmental contingency is dichotomized into being either diverse or integrated. D for diverse, I for integrated. A diverse environment has several products, clients, or regions, and an integrated environment has only one or only a few. For example, let's consider a company that makes and sells computers all over the world. It has consumer clients, small business clients, government clients, etc. It operates in a very diverse environment, so some type of mechanistic organization works best. There should probably be some sort of a divisional form to operate in such a diverse environment. They can organize the structure along products, geography, or clients, but it's definitely divisional and definitely mechanistic. Now consider, for example, a defense contractor that makes only a single product or is a single client or operates in a single place. Suppose they make fighter jets. Their product line may only have one type of fighter jet. They may really only have one client in one region like the U.S. Department of Defense. Their environment is highly integrated. A divisional structure would be ludicrous. They would only have one product division, or one geographic region, or one customer, not multiple products, regions, or products that can make effective use of a divisional structure. They should probably use a mechanistic structure, or more specifically, they might even try a functional mechanistic structure. A fourth contingency concerns the level of competition which is related to resource scarcity. As competition goes up, resources go down. More clearly, as competition goes up, resources become more scarce. This two-pronged aspect of the environment is referred to as either hostile, noted as H, or munificent, noted as M. A hostile environment has many competitors, and thus resources are scarce. A munificent environment has only a few competitors, and resources are therefore abundant. If the firm is operating in a hostile environment, and an organic structure is best because of its ability to immediately be responsive to resource scarcity and to a high number of competitors, they need to make sure that they can be responsive to potentially devastating environmental forces. 
in a munificent environment, there are plenty of resources, high levels of product demand, and very few competitors. In this environment, a bureaucratic mechanistic structure works best because market forces are few and weak, and the firm does not need to organize itself to respond to any urgencies. There are no urgencies, no competitive emergencies, and there is enough of everything to go around, so to speak. Because each of these four contingencies is dichotomized with only two levels, one might think that there are 16 different combinations to consider regarding the environment. There is, for example, an environment that is dynamic, simple, diverse, and hostile. There's another one that is stable, simple, integrated, and munificent. Now, that's a bit of an oversimplification. These contingencies are not true dichotomies. In reality, an environment ranges from completely dynamic to incredibly stable and all points in between. There might be four or ten or a thousand different levels between both of these polar endpoints on all four of these contingencies. Because there is a spectrum of infinite levels of each of these contingencies, there is an infinite combination of an infinite number of levels of these very broadly labeled contingencies. Let's move on. Next, I turn to some tips for business practitioners. First, it is imperative to remember that structure follows strategy. It is not the other way around. Business managers and owners must decide what their strategy is first. If it is to enter a highly competitive industry like consumer electronics, then their strategy is probably different than if they want to enter, enter an industry that is old, has only a few competitors, and has huge financial barriers to entry. A firm that wants to be the number one producer of widgets in North America likely has a different structure than the three guys sharing gardening expenses to the top seller of beets at the local farmer's market. Because their strategies are different, their structures are likely to be different. Second, the structure that your company had on day one is likely to be very different in year 20. In fact, it must be different if it has grown at all. Most firms start with a simple structure. As demand for its products or services become evident, the firm must grow to meet that demand. It must change how it is organized to be more effectively and efficiently meeting its demand. There is a reason that Lockheed Martin doesn't use a simple structure. There is a reason why Billy Bob's Backhoe Repair and Barber Shop doesn't use a geographical divisional structure. Third, this lecture used the Burns and Stalker typology to demonstrate two very broad forms of organizational structure. In reality, over time, most firms develop into hybridized structures. We tend to identify or name the structure based upon what's at the second level, but beneath that level, there can be a mix of geographic team-based functional divisions. It can be a mess, but a simple, easy to follow and easy to understand organizational structure is usually best. It's complicated enough to compete in the modern business world, but when reporting relationships become unclear, it can breed discontent and it can negatively affect individual performance and by extension, firm performance. Every person should know to whom they report. Business practitioners must make that clear. Fourth is that because of the multiple degrees of multiple environmental contingencies and understanding of a firm's environment is critical to its success. Miscalculations and misinterpretations of the environment in which they operate can spell doom for a company. A firm that only focuses inward is likely to be so caught up in introspection that the environment in which it operates can change without them even knowing it. Just ask Toys R Us, Borders Books, Burger Chef, Gateway Computers, and Blockbuster. The CEO should have an outwardly focused role, and the COO should be concerned about internal operations. Without a highly skilled CEO who is capable of viewing and understanding the outside environment, a company is doomed. Lastly, we tend to try and squelch informal communication because it can descend into raw, destructive gossip. It is recommended that managers master the use of informal communication so they can act and react in a near-immediate manner to workplace issues. If a manager hears about an employee with a disturbing personal issue, they need to try and help that employee the best way they can. 
usually ignoring such a problem because it did not come through an official channel like a request from the Employee Assistance Program or EAP, that can destroy human capital in the form of that distressed employee as well as collateral capital of other employees who knew that the manager was aware but did nothing to help and therefore likely values their employees very little. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all on this topic.